8,000 miles from the sun and surf of California, far away at the southern end of Argentina, lies a wild land called Patagonia. From California, by car, by boat, on foot, four men came to climb a mountain that had been climbed only twice before. Four men, Ivan Chenard, internationally known climber, Doug Tompkins, climber, skier, surfer. Dick Dorworth, champion skier, novice climber. And a young English climber, Chris Jones. The mountain is an 11,000 foot pile of glacier and granite. It's got sheer walls, cliffs of ice, wild wind, and bitter cold. It's called Fitzroy, and their objective, the summit. Six months out of the year, Ivan Chenard is a blacksmith. He makes mountain climbing gear, much of it by hand, some of the best there is. The other half of the year, he climbs. He's got an international reputation, and it's growing. The shop's about to close because Ivan and his friends Doug Tompkins and Dick Dorworth have an appointment with a mountain called Fitzroy, far south in Argentina. It'll take months in a second-hand van just getting there. Along the way, there'll be surfing and skiing. Well, let's go. Running, run, 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 running, don't know why. Looking for a place to go, always reaching high. I remember thinking last time that I was home. Pan American Highway is strung like a necklace over the hemisphere. Yvonne, Dick, and Doug follow it through Mexico, and they'll stay on it for thousands of miles till it peters out in the jungle. And then, any way they can, they'll get down to Chile, where they'll pick up a young Englishman named Chris Jones. He's down there on an expedition of his own, and that's good, because as it is, there isn't room in the van to scratch your head. And then on southward, always southward. Watching the road through dusty windows, riding the waves in zero azure, skiing the sand. Once out of North America, the cities and towns are as bright and loud as jungle birds. Guatemala City, where pineapples are a penny each. San Salvador, Managua, Nicaragua, San Jose in Costa Rica. Dick Dorworth's only begun to climb this year. He's listened to Doug Tompkins and Yvonne talk about the Argentine expedition that recently climbed Fitzroy, and he's impatient to get on with it. But South America demands patience. Down here, the clocks don't run, they walk. South of Panama City, the highway loses itself in jungle. So for two weeks, they kill time, waiting for a boat to take the van across the Caribbean to Colombia, where the road starts again. A haircut can save trouble at South American borders, and there are a lot of them to cross before they get to Fitzroy. In the marketplace, Doug Tompkins has his fortune told by a brightly colored little bird who chooses a message just for him. Su familia pensia en usted. Your family is thinking of you.
it's really pretty hard to say sometimes why you'd get in a truck and drive 18,000 miles to climb some mountain. You never really thought about the motives. You never really sat down and analyzed just why you were going to do that. It probably would scare you. From Colón in Panama, the boat crosses to Cartagena in Colombia. The highway picks up again and unwinds through Colombia and Ecuador and then down into Peru. Doug and Yvonne keep an eye on the Pacific surf looking for a chance to unstrap the boards they brought and at Chicama in northern Peru they find it. Waves a mile long and smooth as glass. Yvonne's a fine surfer. Doug's pretty good at it, as he is at almost everything he tries. Dick Dorworth's no surfer, but he wipes out with a good grace. We wanted to find the waves, just to ride a mile of ocean glass. It's a hot, windy summer day, and it won't be long till we're standing tall. Cutting through an ocean full of shifting walls, reaching out to lift me. surfers they talked to sent them down to the little fishing village of Cerro Azul. Across the bay, seabirds watched as Doug and Yvonne decided to see what would happen if you went with the wave under that long pier. Maybe you'd come out the other side still standing up. sell their surfboards in Lima. The money is getting low as the road gets long. South America can be hard on a van that was showing her age when she left California. Ten or fifteen flat tires later and even after a complete engine overhaul, she still needs some encouragement from Yvonne. It's funny traveling down the length of the world, the seasons turn around on you. You start out in the summer, and pretty soon you've gone in the back door into spring. Americans, the Peruvians said, are gluttons for fun. 
So they offered Dick, Doug, and Ivana a spine-cracking 70-mile-an-hour ride on something that used to be a Jeep out over the sand dunes. The boys passed on that, but they did join them on the dunes to do a little skiing. The Peruvians tried to show them how, but Dick Dorworth is an expert skier, a champion, and he started teaching them. Instead of just scooting down the dune, try some of these link turns. Snow skiers have been doing them for years. They tried them out, but what they really liked best was just speeding straight down as fast as they could. And Dick could understand that because it was down here that he once set a world speed record on skis. It was in Portillo, Chile. A team out to break the world speed record has prepared this slope of ice themselves. On the team, Dick Dorworth. After months of training, he's ready for a ride of a few flashing seconds down the slope to the transition point where his speed will be measured. The main thing to do is to keep your body very low and keep very far forward, you know, or like an egg. You must maintain balance at, at all costs. When you start at Portillo, it's a commitment that there's no retreat from. The mountain is 80% steepness, so in 50 yards you're going to be going uh, 80 or 90 miles an hour. That's it, 106 miles an hour to set the record. I haven't run for speed for quite a while now, but because of it, it has enhanced my pleasure skiing. I have much more fun skiing now than uh, I ever had then. Then try this, Dick, Mount Yaima in Chile. A live volcano, its smooth lava slopes neatly snow-packed, maybe the longest ski run in the world. It's like five ski slopes, one on top of another. From the little lodge at its base, it's an eight-hour walk to the top. Yes, a walk. No lifts, not even a rope tow. This is skiing as it was in the beginning, when you climbed as high as you could, skied as far as you'd climbed, and then went home. Yvonne, the climber, the surfer, the mountaineer, is a duffer on skis, about as capable as Dick Dorworth on a surfboard. Dick's watched him fluff and fall, but says Yvonne's a natural skier. Yvonne's willing to ski Mount Yaima, but at his own pace. Near the top, the sulfur fumes are thick, the rocks are warm, and the volcano is breathing quietly in its sleep. Doug? The wind was blowing hard from the north. It would blow the sulfur fumes away from us so we could get right to the very edge, I mean, right to the absolute edge and stick our ski pole right off into the, into the smoke of the steamy volcano. I'd never been that close before. It's the slope that skiers go down endlessly in their dreams. <laughs>
And here comes Yvonne. All the way down the mountain, there's just one fall after another, and finally I just gave up trying to ski it, and I'd just make a traverse, and then I'd, I'd kick a turn, and then I'd make another traverse, and I kept doing that for 5,000 feet. It feels good to be up on a mountain. The cold air in your lungs, the snow under your feet. There's another reason for the skiing, though. Their summer softened bodies are toughening up for the snows of Fitzroy. It's September, spring in the Chilean lake country south of Mount Yaima. The skis have been sold and the last leg of the journey takes them past White Mount Asorno. The further they go, the less road there is to go on. Here the Andes step up and out of Chile and down again into the Patagonian desert in Argentina. The only way over the mountains is by hopscotching from lake to lake on little ferries. There's been a change of plans, though. It looks like there will only be three against Fitzroy. The young Englishman, Chris Jones, didn't show up at the meeting place, and after a few days' wait, they've decided to go on without him. When I realized I wasn't going to make it and that I was going to miss my friends in Chile, I said to myself, if they think they're going to climb Fitzroy without me, they've got another thought coming. There's only one road from the north across the Patagonian desert that takes you to Fitzroy, so I decided to hitch a lift to a point I knew they'd have to pass, and I was prepared to sit there all week if necessary, waiting for them. surprised to see me, but it wasn't until I got in the van that I realized how lucky I'd been to catch them. What if I'd fallen asleep or it had been night or something, and they'd simply driven straight past me? Then where would I have been? Not on my way to Fitzroy, that's for sure. It was in 1834 that a young English naturalist looked out on Patagonia with something like horror at its wild sterility. He and the captain of His Majesty's ship Beagle found the South American ostrich, the wild llama, horses left by the Spaniards, and little else but wasteland. The naturalist's name was Charles Darwin. The captain's name was Robert Fitzroy. From 60 miles off, you first see it. Blue with distance, but harsh, defiant as a clenched fist. This is what you've come for, and from here it doesn't look difficult to climb. It looks impossible. But first, there's some 60 miles of Patagonia to cover. The Rio de las Vueltas, the river of turns to cross. And then the road gives up for good.
Carrying all our gear in the van was easy, but the van had to be left here. Pack horses are the only way to get to the mountain, and then our own two legs. So we thought very carefully about what we would really need. The Argentine army lends a soldier along with the horses to get you to the camp at the base of the mountain. As far as anyone can remember, it was Doug who first said, let's do it, let's climb Fitzroy. He's in its shadow now, a happy man. The weather in Patagonia is as strange and harsh as the land. The horses and men enjoy bright sun all morning, but by afternoon it's raining, and by evening the rains turn to snow. This campsite was established by the French in 1952 and used again by the Argentine expedition some years later. They hurry to set up some shelter, wrestling bags and gear in the wet cold. A little taste of what's to come. But by the next day, Patagonia's changed its mind. The weather's fine again. Doug and Yvonne will scout the first part of the route, comparing their charts with the reality, while Dick and Chris finish setting up camp. Despite the warm sun, they can feel a chill wind off the glacier. Up there, Doug and Yvonne are striking the first blow against Fitzroy. Fitzroy is 11,289 feet high. Not the highest mountain we could find. But as every climber knows, the challenge of the Patagonian mountains isn't necessarily height. It's the technical climbing difficulties and the weather. Charts and maps don't show the storms that brew just 50 miles away on the Pacific, or the winds made down on the continental ice cap that comes screaming across Fitzroy's glacier. Doug and Yvonne scout their planned route, and it looks possible if the wind and weather will let them take it. By late afternoon, they've surveyed as far as a place for a first camp on the mountain. Base camp to Camp One with equipment and supplies. Each of them carries an 80 pound load. No one knows how much time Fitzroy will demand of them, so day after day they haul and carry like pack animals, making kick steps up the steep snow fields, sunburnt, bone aching, exhausted. The mountains are peaceful when the morning comes. Soon the wind will cover our tracks again. As we lift our eyes to a fiery sun that sparkles on fingers of ice and stone. Far above where the eagle flies is a place where you can reach out and touch the sky. And all your troubles just disappear when the wind is strong.
Beyond Fitzroy, tents are useless. The wind would snatch them away like rags. The only security is in a cave dug into the ice. Inside, it's wet, cramped, dark and cold. But it's quiet out of the wind. And at night, it's a lot cozier than anything you could find outside. In fact, Camp One is positively luxurious. A rock outcropping with a view where you can sit and dry your ice-soaked clothes in the sun. A visitor, an Andean condor, soaring on its 10-foot wing spread. This huge bird is really a vulture, and you wonder if you're being filed for future reference. In 1952, a Frenchman, Lionel Touré, led the expedition that climbed Fitzroy for the first time. He was one of the most famous climbers of his day, and he called Fitzroy his greatest achievement. But the time is now, and beyond these snowfields, there will be the first real climbing. The mountains in a good mood, dazzling sun, calm air all day. If this weather holds, they could be on the summit within days. First vertical pitch. Ivan is in the lead. The rope around his waist is belayed by the man below him who will hold him in case of a slip. This is aid climbing where there are no hand or footholds and you ascend on aid slings, foot straps that are a kind of movable ladder. Climbing is a kind of mathematics of danger. Each problem is an equation of rock and muscle and a wrong answer could mean a fall. Yvonne searches without strain for solutions while the man belaying him waits, watching every move. The lead climber's life depends on the pitons he hammers into cracks. The rope that will catch him if he falls is threaded through carabiners hung around the pitons. Alpine-type climbing is a whole mountain full of different problems. Rock walls are one, snow is another. No pitons here. You drive the shaft of your ice axe into the snow and use it for balance while you make kick steps. For traction, you wear spikes on your boots called crampons. If the snow is rotten, it can give way under your weight. After Yvonne has fixed a rope, Dick Dorworth, the junior climber, uses a mechanical ascender called a Jumar to climb the rock face. A gear allows the Jumar to move up the rope, but not down. afternoon and another camp has to be made, Camp 2. They tunnel down into a snow-filled crevasse. 
A natural hollow in the wall of the crevasse makes a fine cave when the loose snow is dug out of it. Only the snow in the crevasse keeps settling and opening a crack in their tunnel floor that has to be continually packed with more snow. Fitzroy's mood is changing. Storm clouds are moving in fast. The winds are mounting, the temperature is dropping, and by the next day, you're buried in snow. be no climbing today or tomorrow or the next day or the next day. In here, four men sit in the murky half-light and look at each other, and the floor keeps opening up. Outside, the mountains wrapped in storm, the winds at gale force, and the temperatures way below freezing. Dick? Each day became the same, day after day. You can read so long, and you can talk about things so long, and uh, you can think by yourself so long. You learn your own rhythm of doing things. After days of being bottled up in the cave, any let up in the weather is an excuse to get out and at least look around, to prove to yourself no movement is possible. Against 100 mile an hour winds, Doug and Chris try to make it to a call where they can see if the storm is letting up. No good. Not far from camp, they're beaten by wind, blind with snow, frozen to the bone, and within a few minutes, they're back inside. You lose track of the days. One said it was 15 days they were nestled in the mountain, another said 18, another 20. It's always twilight inside, and the only time that counts is meal time. soup that gets thinner and thinner, and they tell tales. The oldest escape of men trapped together. Yvonne tells about California and being warm. The ocean, about girls. And you listen between sleeping and waking. It seems sometimes that you're dreaming of being trapped in a cave of ice in Patagonia, and that all the time you're home. When the food's finally gone, they retreat from camp too.
If it had been any storm but a Patagonian storm, Yvonne might have suggested going on with the climb. Whether we climbers want to admit it or not, 90% of the times that we retreat from storms, we could have gone on and just climbed right on through. Most storms in the mountains are merely uncomfortable. They, they won't kill you, but on Fitzroy, these storms are a different story, and you knew you had to get out of there. After weeks of being caged in ice, even going down seems like progress. In the face of the storm, they rappel down the walls, they climbed up, foot by foot, all the way back down to base camp. Back in base camp, the foul weather keeps up. Chill rain, snow, high winds. For nearly a month, there's nothing to do but scavenge and try to keep warm and kill time. Yvonne ekes out their supplies by learning to bake bread in the oven thoughtfully left behind by the French expedition so many years before. Suddenly, one evening, the clouds have shattered, the sky is red, and as every climber knows, red sky at evening means fine weather in the morning. here at the end of the world, when good weather comes, it comes from the south, riding on winds from the Antarctic. Up on Fitzroy, day comes wrapped in clear, inhuman cold. Cold that splits stone. The glacier moves an inch. The wind screams. Nothing lives. All the way back up to where Camp 2 used to be, doing it all again against an old enemy, the wild wind. It took us over an hour to find Camp 2. It was buried under at least 20 feet of new snow. We had neglected to mark the entrance to our ice cave. From here, we can see tomorrow's climb. We can plot an imaginary line of 2,000 feet of frozen granite. If the weather holds, we'll see if that line can really take us to the summit. Yvonne leads the first pitch. 
The mountains are very silent and ominous this early in the morning. You have a lot of fear because fear of the dark, for one thing, and fear of sticking your neck out. Anyway, early in the morning, there's just no brave men early in the morning. The pre-dawn cold is intense, but fingerless gloves are necessary. Bare fingertips can find a hole where gloves would slip. You try to rub some life into frozen fingers while you plan the next move. Ivan, the careful problem solver, has exchanged lead with Doug, the risk taker, the charger. led them to believe that by this time, the climbing should be getting easier. It's not. Above each crest, they find new walls. But the granite is good, rough-surfaced and cracked, and they move fast for a rope of four. Doug and Yvonne are the climbing team. Chris Jones and Dick Dorworth are the hauling team. Between the four of them, even when the handholds turn to finger holes and the footholds become almost non-existent, one way or another, they keep going up. of the climb, I was the last man. I was always hustling to get up to them so they'd have more ropes to use. Usually, by the time I would get to the top of a rope, the rest of the guys would have gone on and left another rope for me. So very often, I was just alone. I'd get to the top of a pitch, and I'd have to coil the rope I'd just jumarred up and uh, get on the next rope and go up that. A lot of times, I would get behind everyone else, and I would find myself alone on the side of Fitzroy. Sometimes it uh, started to get to me, but I never dwelled on it. I just uh, got on my Jumars and Jumared up the rope, got on the next rope and Jumared up that. The way is blocked by a series of towers. The only way up the first tower is a difficult crack. Doug's willing to let Yvonne have first go at it. Yvonne, the graceful, the climber who never seemed to show strain even at the most difficult points. In the end, Fingers numb, boots frozen hard as iron. All his expertise depends on the strength of his arms and his legs and his will. unknown number of pitches left to do and not much daylight left to do them in. On this side of the mountain, oncoming weather can't be seen before it hits. And if it hits, it'll hit hard. Doug struggles up snow-plastered rock while Yvonne belays him. 
This close to the summit, the wind cuts through the cracks and chimneys knife-edged and bitter cold. A chimney is a crack wide enough to get into. This one's fairly easy climbing for a while. Then toward the top, it narrows sharply, and it's Doug's turn to feel the squeeze. Cracks wide enough for your hand, but offers no lip to take hold of, you jam. Force your hand in, make a fist, and pull yourself up. Traversing pitch takes Ivan around the corner of the last tower. Beyond him, he can see the snowfield that leads to the summit. That snowfield has to be reached before the light fails. To be caught up here at night in the storm that could come at any hour would be death. Still, an unknown number of pitches left to do as Doug takes over the lead again. That's it. Off to the west, they can see another storm gathering. That means they've got more hours of climbing yet to do tonight to get down to Camp 2. They ought to turn back right now and get as far as they can from this exposed place, but they won't turn back till they've stood on the summit, just for a moment, just to taste their victory.
Freedom is another life that we share. South to the border, stopping where we may. No one cares how we spend our day. Watching the road through dusty windows, riding the waves in Sarah as a moon, skiing the sand. He never came up, racing the winds down icy 